All right, it's nine o'clock, so let's go ahead and get started. My name is Christina Bambrick. I'm an assistant professor of political science here at the University of Notre Dame. And I'm very excited for our panel today, Dignity Without Borders. We have four excellent presentations and should have plenty of time for Q&A at the end as well. So uh, we'll begin with Professor Andres Lopez from the Universidad de La Sabana. Um, he is a professor and researcher at the Faculty of Law and Political Science and director of the law program at Universidad de La Sabana. He is a doctor of laws from the University of Notre Dame, master in international law from Georgetown University, and a specialist in administrative law and lawyer from Universidad del Rosario. His teaching experience has been developed at Universidad de La Sabana, Notre Dame, and Universidad del Rosario. His doctoral research focused on justifying the liability of transnational corporations for human rights violations based on the principle of solidarity. His postdoctoral academic work focuses on the philosophy of law, human rights, and international law. Next, we have Pedro Payares. Dr. Payares is a professor of, oh, I'm sorry. Um, he's presenting Charles Malik on reason at the UDHR, how to grasp human dignity. Dr. Payares is a professor of philosophy of law and human rights at the Pan American University in Mexico. He received his LLM and his JSD from the University of Navarre and his JD and MED from the Pan American University. His book, Derechos Humanos, or Human Rights, was published by Oxford University Press in 2011. And in that same year, he completed and published the official Spanish translation of Marianne Glendon's A World Made New. Next, we have Adrian Reimers of Holy Cross College presenting Human Rights, Inflation, and Contraction. Dr. Reimers is a graduate of the University of Notre Dame, in BS in Mathematics, MS in Philosophy. And Dr. Reimers received his doctorate from the International Academy for Philosophy in Liechtenstein in 1989. He now teaches philosophy at Holy Cross College in Indiana and previously taught both philosophy and theology courses on John Paul II's Theology of the Body at the University of Notre Dame. He has also taught at the Pontifical University of John Paul II in Krakow and lectured at the John Paul II Catholic University of Lublin, Poland. In 2011, he conducted research on the thought of Karol Wojtyła on a Fulbright Fellowship in Poland. With his wife, Marie, Reimers lives in South Bend, Indiana. They are the parents of four grown children and grandparents of five. And then finally, we have Julio Pol from the University of Navarre presenting Dignity, Language, and the Law. Julio Pol earned his law degree at the National Autonomous University of Honduras, where he graduated top of his class. After graduation, he practiced for seven years in corporate law, investment law, and data privacy at an international boutique law firm in Tegucigalpa, Honduras. Paul holds an LLM in human rights from the University of Navarre in Spain, where he is currently finishing his doctorate in law. He has published scholarly articles in top-rated law journals in Spain and Latin America. Before joining ADF International, Paul conducted research at the De Nicola Center for Culture and Ethics at the University of Notre Dame. So we'll have about 15 minutes per paper, and again, that should leave us plenty of time for Q&A at the end. I'll give our presenters a five-minute warning and a two-minute warning as we're approaching the, approaching the 15 minute limit. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Lopez presenting on the human part of human rights. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here. It's for me an honor, a pleasure to be here. First, my participation in the Center of Ethics and Culture was as a student, and now I'm privileged to be here as a professor, so it's very exciting for me. So the title of my presentation is on the human part of human rights. Human rights discourse in legal and political forums are incoherent because we disagree on the human part of human rights. The agreement that was achieved in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was only about what rights we have, but not why we have them or what the purpose of them is. As Professor Glendon clearly summarized in her book, A Word Made New, that Professor Payares translated into Spanish, the lack of agreement on the reason we have rights and of their purpose did not leave human rights without foundation because, as Professor Finney asserts, inescapably, any pursuit of a political community in which human rights are protected will necessarily involve both selection of some and rejection of other conception of common good. And what does a, mean, a good life mean and about what is good for the human person? Rather than a lack of foundation, what we see today 
is competing understandings about what is a good life, who is a human person, and what does it mean to have dignity. Accordingly, deriving human rights from the fact of being human fails to, to satisfactory ground human rights because it begs a further question, what is a human being? The consequence of the disagreement on the human part of human rights is an incoherent human rights discourse because using the same language, judges reach different conclusions. And, their, and the perception that human rights respond to a political agenda, rather to a truthful pursuit of, for justice for all. Because of the pressure of some groups to impose through judicial activism and political correctness, a particular understanding of human dignity. In this presentation, I pretend to argue against the hegemonic perspective of human dignity, which is the liberal neo-Kantian account of human dignity because of its incompleteness in the problematic consequences it causes to international and national courts reasoning. In contrast, I propose two different but complementary alter alternative perspectives of human dignity. In one hand, the use naturalist conception, and in the other, the communitarian account. All the various conceptions of human dignity agree on that the foundation of human rights is the dignity of the human person. And furthermore, as Professor Carozza has shown in his studies of comparative law, courts agree on two, on two ideas that dignity is an ontological claim that all human beings have an intrinsic moral world, worth, and that dignity is a normative principle that prescribes a form of action to treat each person according to its intrinsic worth. Nevertheless, beyond that, these shared ideas, there is a complex difference between scholars and courts in how they understand and use the notion of human dignity. So let's start with the liberal account. The liberal account of human, of human dignity is the most, understand that dignity is the most essential element of personhood, which is the capacity to choose a conception of the good life and to pursue that option without interference. The protected good of human rights norms is ultimately a person's moral agency, their freedom to choose their good. The role of human rights then is to ensure, I open quotes, that every human being has the freedom needed as a moral agent to pursue goals and objectives of his or her own choosing. In other words, the liberal account of human dignity leads to the conclusion that the justification for human rights is grounded on the need to ensure what all human beings share, namely the freedom required to make the choice that uh, to exercise a moral agency and moral autonomy demand. Dworkin, uses a clear term to define moral agency in the liberal account, moral independence. For Dworkin, moral independence consists in the capacity to choose one's good without the imposition of other moralistic preferences on one's life. The philosophical imprints of the liberal account can be traced to liberalism and its particular notion of freedom as non-intervention or non-restriction. This notion of human dignity is based on Kant's idea of human di dignity set forth in the doctrine of right and critic of practical reason as self-mastery or self-determination. Human beings, self-mastery, is the source of the worth of a human person, according to this account. In the most primary form, it consists of independence from the natural cause order. But here, in a second scenario, the human person is not is self-mastery, is independent from being constrained by another's choice. Here, the human person is the cause of its own effect. Accordingly, for the liberal account of human dignity, human rights are limits to a coercive or otherwise restrictive behavior by others. Dworkin goes one step further in the development of this liberal account and affirms that rights trump the imposition of the majority's preference about a good life on those of the minority. As the argument goes, the rights traditionally described as consequence of liberty are instead the consequence of equality, because every time someone is denied the liberty to live his life as he wants, that, that person is not being treated with equal concern and diminish it, his or her own dignity, because the state is given preference 
to some way of life than a, from another. This notion of human dignity is the hegemonic conception of used by regional human rights tribunals and constitutional courts around the world. In particular, when deciding issues related with privacy and autonomy in cases such as of abortion or euthanasia, liberation, drug use for recreative purposes, protecting prostitution, or supporting gender identity changes in official documents and to surgery. Examples of the influence of the liberal account are multiple in the case law of the regional human rights tri tribunals. For example, in the advisory opinion 2417 of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights about gender identity, the court said, paragraph 18, the convention contains a universal clause for protection of dignity based on the principle of individual autonomy and on the idea that all persons must be treated as equals in as much as they are ends in themselves in accordance with their intentions, aspirations, or life decisions. Moreover, the American Convention also recognizes the sanctity of private and family life, among other protective spheres. The court has affirmed that these spheres of the individual's private life is an area of freedom shielded and exempt from an arbitrary or abuse interference by third parties or public authorities. Based on this understanding, the court asserted that states had an obligation to guarantee the decision of a person to change his or her gender in official documents, and it should be obeyed. Similarly, based on this same idea of human rights as autonomy, the US Supreme Court liberalized abortion in its famous decision, Roe versus Wade. And the European Court of Human Rights granted the request for applying the euthanasia to Diane Pretty in the case Pretty versus UK, or the Colombian Constitution deciding to liberalize the use of recreative drugs and allow et euthanasia for children according to this perspective. The liberal account of human dignity is the idea that underpins the proliferation of new human rights that are harmful to individuals and communities. Furthermore, it, mistakes in at, it is mistakes in at least four grounds. Third, it detaches individuals from their communities because it places them in an oppositional relationship. It gives no consideration whatsoever to the idea that individuals belong to a community and their membership is that in that community requires from them to act in favor of that community's common good. Second, it misrepresents human rights as a set of individual preferences without an explanation of why they could justify correlative duties. Third, it, place, it places the, maximi the maximization of personal autonomy as the main good protected through human rights. Four, it minimizes individual responsibility towards the other because duties are obstacles for freedom to choose. And finally, fifth, it was an extra one, it confuses the idea about a good life with the inherent dignity of the person making impossible public deliberation that implies saying that someone is wrong because that is harmful to his or her dignity and might be discriminatory. So in another set, in contrast, the universalist, the use naturalist account understands human dignity to be the absolute moral worth, worth that a human being has because of its substantive nature as person. In this account, human personhood means having a rational nature, which means to have the radical capacities to reason and choosing. The capacity for reason here refers not to the narrow na notion of following a process of connection, logical syllogisms, but to the capacity to conceptual thought, imagination, and deliberation. It equally refers to the ability to recognize and choose between intelligible goods and to orient one's free will according to reason for action. In short, to the capacity to shape one's life according to reason. The main difference between this account of human dignity and the liberal account is that choosing is not justified merely because it is a decision made by a rational agent. Under the liberal account, any decision made by a rational agent would have the same level of validity. But under this account, human decisions can be mistaken when choosing for something that objectively is not a human good. Under this account, human decisions are justified by the objective goodness of the human good that the rational agents can discern and not by the preference of the subject who chooses. <laughs>
The difference is explained to due at a scepticism of those who defend the liberal account of human dignity in the capacity of the human reason to identify truth about the good for a human person beyond one's own limited perspective. Accordingly, the liberal conception of human dignity lacks a substantial perspective about the good of the human person, leaving it to be decided to each one. In contrast, the natural law can defend a substantial perspective about the good that, but, that can be objectively identified despite, despite our many subjective constra constraints. The lie, of course, resides in thinking that the liberal account is value neutral for not adopting an explicit perspective of the good because it has done it implicitly, affirming that what is good is what each one decides for his or herself. Consequently, for the use naturalist, some preferences or interests will not be regard regarded as rights, as demands, because they are contrary to the well-being of the human person and the state has the obligation to treat differently the various preferences people have precisely because of the equal concern to every per that every person is due. Let me finish explaining the communitarian conception of human dignity that complements this last one. According to the communitarian conception, human dignity is found in the relationality among human beings. The human being finds his or her inner worth in the relationship with others, that is, through its different belongings in its multiple communities, family, work, country. This type of belonging allows him or her to have the reference and identity necessary to understand his or her own identity. The human person in this sense is a dependent and social being that can only flourish within community. Moreover, this dependency comes before independent agency because a human person necessarily requires assistance, nourishment, love, giving and receiving from others in order to become an independent agent able to choose according to reason. This is a communitarian understanding of the human person that affirms that person cannot formulate or seek his own good apart from the community. This communitarian understanding of the person is very much present in African cultures, summarized in the African philosophy of Ubuntu, which means I am because we are. A person is a person through other persons. Emmanuel Levinas, a representative of this account of human dignity, argues that a Kantian understanding of the human person as an end in itself leads us to an idea of a plurality of free wills in conflicts that are potential limitations of each other. Such conflict leads to an agreement of reciprocal limitations between, between free wills supported by the power of the state, a destruction of communities, and the strength of a state's power. The solution to such individualistic approach caused by the neo-Kantian understanding of human dignity is what Levinas calls proximity with the other that has a face. This proximity is an encounter with another person that enables me to become aware of the demands coming from that other self. The recognition of the other is an inherently worthy and valuable being that we have mutual responsibilities for taking care of each other is the consequence of the encounter with the other that has a face. As a, as a consequence of that encounter, I find myself responsible for the other, for his hunger, his suffering, and his need. The natural and communitarian conception of human dignity are better approaches than the liberal account because they can express, in academic terms, our common experience of what means to be human. The experience of finding a dignified life we la we, when we live in community, loving and being loved. The experience of discovering that there are decisions that are harmful for one, uh, one's body, our self-esteem, families and communities, even if they were chosen by us or someone else in our community. The experience of finding righteousness in the claims of those who have been denied their most basic needs, such as food, shelter, freedom from torture or life, not because they have a preference for that, because, but because those are objectively the minimum aspects an individual requires for its development and well-being. In short, first, there are different account, accounts of human dignity than the liberal one, which is in itself a discovery for many lawyers trained in top law schools in Latin America and in the United States. Second, more importantly, 
There are other accounts of human dignity, and although are still in complete understanding of the on mystery that is to be a human person, are better accounts of the ontological reality that grounds our inherent moral world, which grounds human rights. Third, ideas have power, and human rights activists will not stop damaging individuals and communities if judges and those with decision power remain asserting wrong or incomplete ideas about the human part of human rights. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lopez. Next, we have Dr. Pedro Payares presenting Charles Malik on reason at the UDHR, how to grasp human dignity. Thank you, good morning. My paper tries to answer this question. What idea of reason was shared by Charles Malik to his colleagues during the drafting process of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights? The short answer is this one. When Malik refers to reason in the context of human rights, he implies three things. First, a particular idea of natural law. Second, an empathy as a way to understand the point of view of another person. And lastly, an expression of the drama of being alive as a human. And that's my paper. Thank you very much. No, <laughs> I'm going to explain it. <laughs> but that's the, the, the core. Article 1 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights states, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should act toward one another in a spirit of brotherhood. The drafting history of this formula suggests that the article represents the intellectual core of all declaration. Glendons declares that Article 1 has an expression of faith in human intelligence and fellow feeling. Where does, end of quote, where does its novelty lie? What words or idea was expressed that, expressed that innovation? On June 15 and 1947, a specialized working group was rearranging the first outline of the declaration. The French delegate, René Cassin, proposed an Article 1 that stated two kinds of affirmations. The first one, a factual description of human beings, a metaphysical statement. And secondly, an ethical consequences. All men being <coughs> members of one family are free, possesses equal dignity and rights, and shall regard each other as brothers. The next day, the working group incorporated a new element into the article, an epistemological reference, being endowed with reason. Almost six more months later, Carlos Romulo from the Philippines proposed the addition of the contested, contested words by nature. Now, the formula reads, being endowed by nature with reason and conscience. As it is well known, the expression by, by nature was dropped from the final version of the document, something that Charles Malik always regretted and attributed in part to a defici deficiency, deficiency in the translation between English and French that lightened the philosophical expression but its own nature with a simple by nature. In spite of this deletion, Malik always understood that the Declaration still has a room from the Thomistic doctrine of natural law. Why? In part, because of the reference to inherent dignity and rights, or a series of ontological statements. In part, because of his particular understanding of the word reason and its epistemological implications. These two elements are the main components of the idea of natural law explained by Jacques Maritain as normality of its functioning and knowledge by connaturality. So, during the drafting process of the declaration, Malik explained that Article 1 and Article 18 on religious freedom meant a specific understanding of the human condition embedded with teleological intelligibility and an inherent disposition to grasp the practical requirements of that design. So, regarding to the ontological reference to a natural law theory, he, in February 1947, said to his colleagues, quote, I wish further to, to say that the very phrase human rights 
obviously refer to man, and that by rights you certainly mean something that flows from the nature of man as requirement of his own existence. End of quote. Regarding to ep epistemological aspect, Malik understood that reason and reasoning constitutes a process that born within the human condition but has to be expressed by a proper action. That is the use of reason. He described this action as to became, become a person, and he successfully, successfully incorporated this experience into Article 18 on religious freedom. In 1946, he says to his drafter colleagues, quote, and there is one point on which we wish to insist more than anything else, namely that it is not enough to be, it is not enough to be free what you are, you must also be free to become what your conscience requires you, to become in the light of your best knowledge. It is freedom of becom becoming, of change, that we stress just as much as freedom of being. For Malik, and for, for Malik, freedom of conscience and thought was not just the right to have a preferred opinion, but the right to become a person by reasoning as an acting person. He saw human rights not as a st static reality, but as, a, as the dynamism that reveals and elevates human person. This is why he deplored the tendency to disregard a word as nature or any attempt to downgrade the importance of Article 1. He said, the first article of the Declaration on Human Rights should state those characteristics of human beings which distinguish them from animals, that is, reason and conscience. Without reason, the very work they were engaged, it, it would be impossible. What then is more reasonable than the explicit mention of the factor which constitute the basis of their work in the very first article? End of quote. These ideas, these ideas of reason can be traced to his early days as professor of philosophy in Beirut, in 1939, Malik edited a collection of texts from great philosophers as a textbook for his philosophy class. He prepared an introduction in which he explained the importance of philosophy and the role of the great master. There he said, things have a way of immediately revealing themselves to reason. The great masters try, try to, scoop, to scoop the truth of a thing out of itself and not out of something else. Everything has its own proper nature, its own proper truth, and it is part of adequacy tenderly to attend to it in itself, simply letting its truth come out from within. The great masters teach us this infinite, patient tenderness where there is no haste, no distortion, no abstraction but the pure desire to let the mother speak for itself." End of quote. Malik thought that we need great master as guys that, that teach us how to recognize the basic human requirements of our life through their experience. In other words, we need teachers to understand the requirements of natural law and how to understand that experience and what kind of discourse allowed us to understand that knowledge. Malik suggests let us call it a philosophical empathy with, the, a, with a great master. For example, knowing Aristotle as philosopher requires us to place ourselves in the same, in the same place in which Aristotle posted, posted himself in order to see what he saw. From that perspective, we grasp the truth that he saw and this experience of phil philosophical empathy allowed us to understand his reflection. This shared side was called by Malik the moment of truth. But why can we say, see what Aristotle saw? Malik implies that our shared human nature and the ba basic structure of reason enable us to grasp the truth uh, that is, it, it is a sign of something called natural to our shared human nature. Also, Malik academic papers, lectures, and academic talks shows us that reason and reasoning occur in the middle of the drama of human existence. Reasoning do not happen in a, in a, 
vacuum. Malik thought that reason in action reveals the drama of someone who experienced vulnerability, a sense of, la of longing, a passion for authenticity, and origini original brokenness. His classes on Dostoevsky, Augustine, or Plato show someone called Charles Malik who sees his life as someone who is looking for God and the meaning of his life. You can feel this tension, for example, when he wrote this note in a report at the end of a course. There were moments in which it was futile even to ask questions, and philosophy could not exist without the grace of discerning the questionable character of existence. As a result, I suffered at, time, at times in for forcefulness and quality. My soul was torn apart in many directions, and I had to struggle hard to maintain my self-identity. But against this soul of mine and against the forces fashioned it, I am waging a most bitter fight day, fight day and night. The two likes controlling my fights are, cry, are Christ and Plato. In them, there is no looseness and no self-lostness." End of quote. I want to finish my paper with one of the most beautiful intervention of Malik at the drafting process of the declaration that may be a summary of his idea of reason as natural law a sympathy in the search, empathy in the search of truth, and as a drama. Talking, talking to his drafting colleagues about the meaning of writing a universal declaration of human rights, he says, we, requ we require, I submit, the sensitive insight of the poet, the prophet, the philosopher. And I hope we shall call in this type of finds to aid us in our important enterprise. If only jurists and politicians and diplomats work out this bill, I'm afraid it will come out of distorted thing. It, it will lack vision and unity. It will, like, it, it will lack sweeping simplicity. Vision and sensi sensitive belong preeminently to the prophet, unity to the philosopher, simplicity to the poet. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Pariadas. Next, we have Dr. Adrian Reimers presenting Human Rights, Inflation, and Contraction. Good morning. Pope John Paul II was arguably the most effective interpreter of the Universal, Universal Declaration of Human Rights over the past in the, these past 73 years. In his confrontation with totalitarian dictatorships of Central and Eastern Europe, in his engagement with Latin American authoritarian dictatorships, he effectively appealed to the principles of human rights as he pushed for needed social, political, and economic changes. Thank you. Um, Speaking before the United Nations General Assembly in October 1979, Pope John Paul II said, and I quote, the real way, the fundamental way to peace is through each human being, through the definition and recognition of, and respect for the inalienable rights of individuals and communities of peoples. John Paul II's advocacy for human rights was not, however, in a form that we might have expected. He never directly addressed politics. He did not use the words communism or totalitarianism. Neither did he appeal for some kind of legal enforcement of the rights, for example, by appealing to the Helsinki Accords of 1975. Instead, he appealed to consciences, first to the conscience of those in power, but also to the conscience of those whose rights were violated. By appealing openly to the rights of the human being, he undercut the pretensions of totalitarian ideology and restored the hopes and dignity of those subjected to ideological control. His appeal was moral then and not legal. Furthermore, without denying the importance of material issues, he spoke of rights, quote, to food, clothing, housing, sufficient health care, rest, and leisure. His primary emphasis was on the rights to spiritual goods, praising in the Universal Declarations uh, the primacy 
given to spiritual values and by the progress of moral life. The central co concept governing his analysis of an appeal to human rights, indeed the basis of these rights, is the dignity of the human person as a rational being possessed of conscience. By his reason, man can know and understand truth, and by his conscience, he can discern good and evil and choose the good. So, inflation of rights, how and why. At issue here is the question of the inflation of rights. If human rights are so important, how can, in, in, how can an inflation of rights be anything but a great good? The real problem, of course, is not that there are too many rights, nor that human rights are too great. The problem is that we are not clear about what, right, what rights are, about what is the essence of a human right. Uh, I'm going to cite John Stuart Mill somewhat, not because we all read and obey Mill, but because he, in fact, effectively, very effectively, I think, uh, reflects the ethos of the contemporary industrial, democratic state. He writes in his book on liberty, the sole end for which mankind are warranted in interfering with the liberty or action of any of their, the liberty of action of any of their number is self-protection. Over himself, over his own body and mind, the individual is sovereign. So no person or group nor even the community under its government is warranted to interfere with individual freedom except to protect itself. Over himself, the individual is sovereign. Of course, Mill is careful to nuance, nuance this account, allowing for the state to require services such as military or jury duty of its citizens. The line between public and private harm may sometimes be unclear, consider the controversies over cigarette smoking and recreational drugs. Nonetheless, the libertarian principle stands firm. The individual, and only he, determines for himself how he is to live and to what end. Mill's basis for this principle is no abstract right, but simply utility. I quote, I regard utility as the ultimate appeal on all ethical questions, but it must be utility in the largest sense grounded on the permanent interests of man as a progressive being. So for Mill, Utility means nothing more or less than the greatest happiness principle. And this we find in his book on utilitarianism. By happiness, he writes, is intended pleasure and the absence of pain. By unhappiness, pain and the privation of pleasure. Although Mill is careful to explain what this, that his principle precludes rank debauchery, and further that it, its proper understanding requires a concern for the happiness of others, the standard of utility is ultimately subjective. What pleases people is good to the extent that it leaves them feeling satisfied. Although Mill argues warmly that the pleasures of the mind are to be preferred to those of the body and that the populace should be encouraged by state organs of education and public opinion to pursue those higher pleasures, pleasure is irreducibly subjective. Only the individual subject, subject can know what he enjoys. And since pleasure is the criterion of happiness, which for its part is the criterion of mora morality, according to Mill, only the individual can know what is good for himself. The ultimate criterion of good and evil then is in the final analysis, the judgment of the experiencing subject. Mill's principle of freedom has two consequences. First, there can be no objective touchstone of good and evil. Second, a person's dignity resides in the fact that no other person can legitimately impose his will upon him. No other person may legitimately say to me, this is good, you must recognize and embrace it as good. What I want is good because I want it. To deny one's own evaluation of the good is to insult his dignity. From this principle, it follows that there can be no common good. Uh, let me... Well, okay, so I want to get on to the state and the enforcement of rights. Writing about materialistic philosophy as a society, and materialism is the default philosophy of our civilization, Jacques Maritain writes, and I quote, it has been frequently noted that bourgeois liberalism 
with its ambition to ground everything in the unchecked initiative of the individual, conceived as a little god, and the absolute property, pro, excuse me, liberty of property, business, and pleasure, inevitably ends in statism. The rule of the number produces the omnipotence of the state. Note Maritain's use of the phrase, a little god. God is a supreme being, the author of all truth, the exemplar of all that is good, and the criterion of reality. If the human individual human being is the ultimate judge of all truth, and he desi his desires constitute the standard for goodness, then he is a god, perhaps not the almighty god, but a god nonetheless. Associate Justice Anthony Kennedy of the U.S. Supreme Court famously wrote, and I quote, at the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and of the mystery of human life. The being that does these things is a god, and the prerogatives of this god are his rights. And because different autonomous persons claim different rights, their rights can come into conflict. Mill writes, and I quote, to have a right then is to have something which society ought to defend us in the possession of. Because the state is precluded from recognizing any substantive value as a common good, its judgments concerning rights, especially when rights are in conflict, must be formal. Decisions cannot be made with, re formal and not substantial in other words. Decisions cannot be made with reference to a transcendent common good, but only according to the value neutral procedures accepted as fair to all so that each person enjoys reasonably unfettered access to the good as he or she conceives it. Human rights are thereby inflated according to the desires of individuals. If such liberalism fosters an inflation of rights in one way, Marxist theory does so in another. The history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggle, he writes. A struggle arising between the oppressors and the oppressed. Now, although Marx addressed economic and production conflicts, uh, between the proletariat and bourgeoisie, the principles of his analysis are now applied to any identifiably opposing classes, men versus women, whites versus blacks, LGBTQ versus straight, and so on. Even though Marxist collectivism stands sharply opposed to individ liberal individualism, it results in a similar inflation of rights as groups whose interests are perceived to be suppressed by more powerful groups assert their own rights. Therefore, just as Marx originally called for the abolition of the state with its classes of workers and capitalists, the neo-Marxist conception calls for a society um, in which any signs of oppression must be suppressed. The majority opinion in the US Supreme Court's decision on same-sex marriage repeatedly refers to the, quote, humiliation experienced by same-sex couples in the face of the broader uh, society. There we read, quote, and I'm quoting from the decision there in, in, in Obergefell. Same-sex couples are denied benefits afforded opposite-sex couples and are barred from exercising a fundamental right, especially against a long history of disapproval of their relationships. This denial's, denial works a grave and continuing harm, serving to disrespect and subordinate gays and lesbians. It's a class conflict here. Um, and this con subjection constitutes oppression. Uh, in this Supreme Court decision, members of the LGBTQ class are formally relieved of the disrespect they experience from the majority. Therefore, it's necessary that they, like every oppressed class, must struggle to have their rights over against the majority, the oppressors, affirmed and guaranteed by state authority. According to the pastoral constitution, Gaudium et Spes, the soul with its powers of reason and conscience is the foundation for human dignity. Two decades before his election to the papacy, John Paul II wrote of the human person as a rational being who lives from his interior life and in virtue of whose reason and will has the power of self-determination. But contrary to Mill's utilitarianism, the human person is not simply a consumer of products and experiences. Uh, in his 1980 address to, the, to UNESCO, he wrote, quote, Therefore, referring to the origins of your organization, UNESCO, I insist on the necessity of mobilizing all the powers that direct the spiritual existence of 
dimensions of human existence which testify to the primacy of the spiritual in man, of that which corresponds to the dignity of his intelligence, of his will, and of his heart, in order not to succumb again to the monstrous alienation of collective evil, which is always ready to use its material powers in the mortal struggle of man against man, of nations against nations. Um, he goes on in another, um, actually in his, well, let me quote. In, in Latin America, he certainly condemned the oppression of the poor by the powerful, but he also called on the poor to lay hold of their indignity, own dignity. Um, this was in a, an address to the poor of Las Minas district in Dominican Republican, Republic. By calling you to cult cultivate your spiritual and evangelical values, I wish to make you think of your dignity as men and children of God. I wish to encourage you to be rich in humanity in love for the family, in solidarity with others. At the same time, I exhort you to develop more and more the possibility you have of obtaining a situation of human, greater human and Christian dignity. He's speaking to the poor. In a similar way, Václav Havel, addressing the suffocating power of the communist regime in Czechoslovakia, said that the, quote, power of the powerless, title of a famous essay by him, lies not in acquiring more goods and political power, but rather in living in truth rather than by ideological lies. Human dignity rests not on what one has or experiences, but on how a person relates to truth. Human rights are powerful, but their power lies not so much in this, their specifically legal application as in conscience. By its very nature, a human right is based on knowledge of the truth about the human person and his authentic good. From a materialist perspective, whether individualistic, mill, or collectivist, Marx, human rights can only inflate because by the virtue of their own particularity, every other person or group threatens one's perceived rights. If they're my rights. Okay. Conceived spiritually, human rights are promoted from within its conscience and externally in dialogue as human beings and societies grapple seriously with their shared, shared humanity. Thank you, Dr. Reimers. Next, we have Julio Pol presenting Dignity, Language, and the Law. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for being here Saturday morning. I know it's tough. Uh, today, my talk is on the topic of Dignity, Language, and the Law, concretely following an original idea developed by Professor Pilar Zambrano. I will argue that the concept of human dignity when used in both human rights instruments and human rights adjudication is useless if it is grounded in a conventionalist semantics approach. Moreover, when the concept of human dignity is purely conventional, that is, that it draws its meaning solely from semantic conventions in language and not from an external reality to which it refers, it becomes unintelligible. Its meaning becomes muddled, contributing to confusion in legal discourse. On the contrary, the only way to make sense of the concept of human dignity in legal discourse is from a realist semantics perspective that gives priority to the reference, in this case, to the self-evidence or self-intelligibility of human nature and human goods over its conventional meaning. The structure of my talk is the following. First, I am going to review the use of the concept of human dignity in international and regional human rights instruments, and will show how such use has not only increased over time, but expanded around the globe in very different jurisdictions and legal traditions. Second, I will show how this expansion in the use of the concept of human dignity as the foundation of human rights and as the ultimate grounding, oh, sorry, ultimate argument to grant human rights adjudication is contested by scholars who claim that the concept of human dignity is useless, ineffective, and renders contradictory results. I think this has been a common topic over these three days, and Andres was explaining uh, a little bit of this, so we'll just be, be short on it. The interesting thing or the paradox here 
is that we have granted a special status to the legal concept of human dignity and its use has increased in human rights adjudication with the purpose of clarifying and making universal human rights discourse across culturally diverse jurisdictions. But the result of this increased use has led to, on one hand, more confusion in the very discourse it was supposed to clarify, and on the other hand, to a parochial understanding of those human rights that were supposed to be universal. Third, I will show how this paradox can be solved only after we realize that its cause is a conventionalist semantics approach to the concept of human dignity and to legal concepts in general. To do this, we will briefly review some ideas of philosophy of language that lead us to conclude that semantic conventionalism only contributes to the lack of intelligibility of legal discourse. To conclude, I will argue that in response to the paradox, we should not abandon altogether the use of the concept of human dignity, but we should understand it from a realist semantics perspective and at the same time limit its use to a normative function. We will begin by stating that dignity is a widely used concept. The concept of human dignity is mentioned in practically all human rights documents, treaties, and instruments. After World War II, with the need to ground human rights in a way that would accommodate the most varied philosophical, legal, and theological traditions, the drafters of the human rights instruments and promoters of the novel human rights discourse took advantage of the concept of dignity that had also Kantian connotation to foster a discourse that would be universally valid in multinational and pluricultural contexts. Despite its Western origin and its prevalent use in Catholic theological thinking, since its incorporation in the human rights treaties, the concept of human dignity has gained an ample acceptance and it has been adopted in the most varied jurisdictions. The term human dignity is included in all major human rights instruments. <laughs> Similarly, all major political constitutions around the globe somehow root the rights of their citizens in an idea of human dignity. This is especially the case of those constitutions that came into being after grave and generalized injustices. For example, the German, the Israeli, South African constitutions include express and robust human dignity language. Even in places like Canada, Japan, or India, where the respective constitutional texts do not include a direct nor a literal reference to dignity, the constitutional courts have consistently introduced such concept via interpretation and judicial review. At the same time, human rights adjudication in the national, regional, and universal systems has been increasingly reliant on the concept of human dignity. Courts around the globe have used the, term, the same term dignity to support decisions on all sorts of topics. This increased use and expansion is paradoxical. As we mentioned before, human dignity has been the single most used court concept to adjudicate human rights at different levels. Nonetheless, the way judges interpret rights based on the idea of dignity has shown that its meaning is elusive and unclear. For instance, on the one hand, there are some that base their claims to protect the unborn and the sick in the inherent dignity of all human beings, while on the other hand, others promote euthanasia as dying with dignity. Similarly, constitutional case law supporting abortion in same-sex unions here in the US, as Professor Adrian was saying, rests on the idea that those are choices of liberty and ultimately of personal dignity. How is it possible for dignity to be so malleable concept and to be able to support so many and even contradictory positions among rights? This expansion in the use of the term has brought to the surface the enormous differences in the way of the, concepts, the concept human dignity is used in judicial interpretation. For this reason, many scholars claim that the use of the concept of dignity is legitimate altogether because it is seen solely as a rhetorical instrument that functions as a wild card and gives judges the capacity to argue almost any position, even contradictory ones, in any case, with relative success, such that no other argument is longer needed. In other words, the concept of human dignity has been promoted to stress the common and universal understanding of human rights across jurisdictions. But in contrast, Sambrano states that it has created human rights that are, quote, culturally relative, deeply contingent on local politics and values, 
resulting in significantly diverging and even conflicting conceptions, end quote, of what it means to be human. As she also states, there is a, quote, paradoxical friction between the overwhelming rhetorical force of the concept of dignity and its elusive meaning, end quote. What's more, despite this widespread use, quote, when it comes to its substantive meaning, consensus is rapidly swapped for disagreement, end quote. Today, the debate on human dignity, human rights, is not only heated, but meaningless. Like in Babel, we engage in a discussion where understanding becomes impossible. We're using the same word, namely human dignity, in totally different ways to sustain radically opposed views of the human person. This is due in part to a widespread idea that a concept of dignity has no content, or if it has content, it is due to mere consensus. In other words, that dignity means what it means solely because we have agreed on it. As Paolo Carosa points out, it is widely accepted that, quote, in the judicial interpretation of human rights, there is no common substantive conception of dignity, although there appears to be an acceptance of the concept of dignity, end quote. In other words, some argue that for consensus to be possible, the core meaning of the concept of human dignity should not only lack of a strong referent, but that at its core, its meaning must be flexible and open, entirely conventional. According to the conventional semantics approach, underlying the use of the concept of dignity in current legal discourse, there is no necessary relationship between the meaning of a concept and the external reality to which it applies. And on the contrary, this connection is due only to social con conventions. For many, the meaning of concepts is fully conventional. This means contextual and agreed by the relevant community in a way that the meaning can change drastically if the underlying agreement that supports it also changes. Furthermore, I am not raising the point that concept words can be vague or ambiguous, nor that contextual information is, is relevant, it's irrelevant for its interpretation. I agree with the tenet that semantics and pragmatics both are relevant and even necessary for conceptual interpretation. They interact in different ways to help grasp the meaning and apply terms. Instead, my argument here is that the interpretation of concept words like dignity used in legal discourse is unintelligible, impossible to understand, and therefore useless if its semantic interpretation is based on a conventionalist approach that considers the referent of the concept, in this case, human nature and human goods, should be relegated to a secondary or even auxiliary role, while its sense or its intention is deemed as the exclusive determinant factor for its meaning. In other words, if there's no strong reference to the real or external world, then concepts can only be understood by the sense with which they are used, whether the product of consensus or conventions, and even in most radical cases, of parochial contexts. Thus, conventional semantics leads to obscure the authority of law, and more importantly, is intelligibility. This erratic and contra contradictory use of the concept of human dignity in judicial interpretation has brought some to argue that the best solution to this paradox is to obliterate entirely the concept of dignity from the legal lexicon. In other words, according to Loisy, the paradox displays that, quote, the fact that dignity seems to be the official justification of human rights in the major documents is not sufficient reason for us to conclude that dignity is actually the foundation of human rights. The meaning of dignity is not clearly delineated with the context of the major human rights documents, end quote. But concluding that it would be beneficial to abandon the use of the term dignity as the foundation of human rights due to its inability to give a clear sense of what it means is misguided. Although the concept of dignity might be divisive because its meaning is currently unclear, we should not abandon it. It is short-sighted to stop using the concept of dignity because we think it's confusing or useless in current usage. Unless we tackle the real cause of disagreement and confusion, which is semantic conventionalism, the same confusion that now exists with dignity will resurface somewhere else in another more precise concept we come up with, or even at another level of the debate. More importantly for our discussion today, 
without a correctly understood concept of dignity, human rights discourse and adjudication will lack the true normative force that stems from the fact that human beings are to be treated with justice as such. Neither interests alone nor positivistic st state obligations can be sorts of such normativity. The solution to the paradox of dignity lies therefore in the recognition that, as Zambrano states, quote, the intelligibility of legal language is ultimately grounded on the intrinsic intelligibility of human nature and human goods, end quote. Thanks. Thank you for four terrific papers with some very compelling connections, which I think will come out in Q&A. So um, if you have a question, please step up to the microphone. I think we'll probably take two at a time just because we're somewhat short on time. Um, keep it relatively brief and um, direct it to the speaker that you would like to ask. To any of the speakers, um, this doesn't seem to work. Also, feel free to introduce yourself. I'm Tom Lochran here, from here at the University of Notre Dame. I'm in the physics department here. Um, What's the way forward? What, given, what, given the problems, and there's a very common set of themes in the analyses of your problem, uh, your problem analyses, what are the practical steps forward, if, if you've envisioned any? What, what sort of gathering ought to take place? Who ought to be there? What the topics ought to be? To come up with a, a more robust conception of human dignity. Whoever would like. Well, even though I prepare my, my paper as a philosopher of law, I'm a lawyer first. So what I've learned is that when we focus our uh, human rights adjudi adjudication process and argument on the victims and the people who suffer a, a violation of uh, their human rights, when these discussions uh, tend to avoid the, cent the centrality of the victim because when the, the Supreme Court, at least in Mexico or Inter-American Court of Human Rights, uh, reason on dignity and, and human rights, they tend to uh, dictate a sentence without any regard on how can we, how can we success or succeed in implementing that kind of requirement. So if we start to think through the victim, maybe this, this, this kind of problems we uh, settle up because the victim and, the, and their problems uh, are very concrete and very specific and, and that would open many doors uh, that resolve our problem. Thank you for the question because that is a question I also have been struggling with. And I, I'm going to start with the end and then go backwards to what we should be doing in a step uh, like base. Uh, I mean, the problem is that the ideas that judges have, uh, the ideas we, they have been uh, trained with are very, as I told, the hegemonic understanding of human dignity. And it's very hard to think differently because it's attractive to think that dignity is to do whatever I want and no one should be telling me what to do. And that's the rhetoric for I mean, almost all human rights lawyers. And when they reach uh, these decision uh, positions, they just express what they have in mind without realizing there are other options. So I would say one step work backwards is making attractive and um, reasonable and plausible to understand other understandings, understandings of human dignity that are also compelling. Because um, as a professor, I'm a, I'm a lawyer first, and a professor of law, my students, when I question them about this, uh, they have a belief, it's, it's, it's not rational, it's a belief on the concept of human dignity and the liberal understanding of dignity. Um, so when you question them, it's like, it's hard. They don't like to be questioned. And if you teach even older lawyers, you know, people that are in the, in the courts, even worse, there is a belief, it's, it, um, there is a, a book called Who Believes in Human Rights. It's kind of a religion 
uh, you know, uh, thing, uh, questioning, like, yeah, it's, it, there is a creed about human rights and everything. Um, so I would say make plausible another understanding of human dignity. In education, I would say, um, this is what a star Professor Glendon in Harvard and Professor Carozza as the project of uh, building foundations of human rights. And I'm part of that project. Just I start here, and I'm doing that in Latin America, and whatever I want, I, I can go, is um, to teach the, my students different understandings of, of what it means to be human. And that being human doesn't end in choosing. Um, I would say that. Yeah, I w um, the question, what should we do, is, uh, is it you asked, uh, what's the way forward? There is a serious cultural problem that we have, and that is, uh, and I'm not speaking about the law because I don't know the law, but what's good? We tend to think of the good materialistically, especially in our public life. Uh, you might think that the only kind of sex to have is heterosexual, which is already a misstatement. Uh, family life, children are very good, if you know. But, of course, the argument is, yeah, but who are you to de deprive uh, another couple the right to have their own kind of family life. I think of our former mayor, who's now Secretary of, of uh, Transportation, right? He and his partner have adopted two twins. Uh, and are you going to deny them that happiness? Uh, because, you know, everybody, it seems, has a right to happiness. But happiness understood as certain pleasures and possessions, frankly. Uh, we've become very materialistic in our outlook. Our common discourse has tended to become materialistic and utilitarian. And as John Paul said, we've lost sight of our spiritual values, but living with the truth for the authentic good, uh, which can be known. It is not just what I think is good. Uh, did you want to say something? Another question? Sarah Johnson. I'm a um, former M MD grad. Um, my question is, uh, thank you all for your talks. Very, very um, wonderful presentations. Um, is, can um, any human right, is, do, is there any foundation for human rights apart from recognizing God? Well, uh, the experience from the drafters of the Universal Declaration is, is this one that could be used as an answer. They, uh, even though they uh, did not, do not agree or did not agree on, on a specific way of formulate uh, foundation, fa the, fa the final argument of justification of human rights, still they, they defend that we can grasp, uh, they, they can answer this, this question. I wanna try to formulate more clearly than the other way, the, the other day because I tried to formulate it before. So they said, okay, even though we are not agreeing the fundamental uh, principles, still when someone says I have a human right, we believe Reasonable, reasonable, uh, reasonably believe that the other person can understand what I'm saying and what I'm referring to, and at the same time, the, the other person can f f uh, know that has a moral obligation toward that kind of uh, statement. So that's a, a basic uh, argument and the starting point of uh, a following discussion on human rights. It's like, a, I don't know how to say in English, this kind of stairs that are circular stairs. So in the, you, you, you can have a, 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 the first turn together in, in a very basic conversation. And the Universal Declaration has that first 
360 turn. And they, it, they, that's a complete argument, but not a finished argument because you can still follow it up. So I think that even though we cannot have a complete argument, still we have this, this first turn of, in the stairway and in, 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 in move forward from that. I want to turn to to turn to the um, constitution, the pastoral constitution on the Church in the Modern World, Gaudium et Spes, the first chapter of which is titled "The Dignity of the Human Person," and so this answers direct, directly answers your question, actually, because the the council points to the fact, the scriptural fact, the fact of revelation that we are all created in the image and likeness of God. Uh, it then goes on to to articulate that in terms of the fact that the human being has been gifted with uh, the power of reason, which is capable of knowing not just truths, but the highest truth. And it's cap we are capable uh, of seeking out the highest good. In other words, our dignity is rooted in the fact that we can know God and try, you know, we can try to approach God. We have a conscience by which we hear the voice of God. Uh, so the answer to your question is, yeah, a uh, coherent and a fully satisfying concept of human dignity has to be rooted in, the, in, in, in God. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you want to say yeah, please. Uh, so, Thanks. So I would say that it's impossible, uh, answering your question directly, to understand uh, human rights without God. And I like the, 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 the quote that uh, Professor Payares mentioned about Malik, that he was saying that reality, uh, things have always uh, a way to reveal them, themselves to reason, and reality and the ultimate reality, God, is always a way to reveal it, it's, uh, himself to, to human reason, uh, as Professor Ramirez was, was mentioning. So, so uh, it, it, I mean, it would be impossible to, to create a human rights discourse without God. And, and when we try to do it, like without na understanding the nature of things as they are, we come to the problems that we have now, which is conflicting uh, conceptions and even incoherent uh, uh, decisions and inconsistencies. So, no. I, I agree with what everyone has said. I, I think, I mean, the last and first source of human dignity is God. So again, and a satisfying response to what is a human being and why a human being is worthy is because he's created, as you mentioned, in, uh, of, of God. But we have a responsibility, and I would say that, to um, make a persuasive argument without reference to God. And um, the, our incapacity to, that, to do that um, is the reason why many secular uh, lawyers have been preferring, or they only know one other answer, because if I don't believe, and this is the other, the other answer, this is the right one. So we need to express in a non-religious perspective this reality that only would be satisfying if we uh, open to faith and, and, and grace, but I, and I think it's possible, but it's a long way rather than a short way that is the other way. Please. Good morning. Thank you very much for all of your presentations. They were fantastic. Uh, I would like to address a question to Professor Lopez and to Julio, Professor Julio, because um, I find it very, like it is worry, worrying me a lot, the evolution and progressive interpretation of human rights, uh, like the judges are, especially in Latin America, they're, um, developing, well, the concept of free development of personality, but with that, it has no content, no substantive content. So how are we to place freedom within nature in law? I think that is one of the, like, the problems. Like, freedom is completely separated from nature, so how can we bring freedom within nature in law? And also, eh, I think, uh, how can we I think all the presentations addressed the concept of reason, but mainly like mainstream um, culture focuses on theoretical reason. How are we to incorporate practical reason? 
because there's truth in, in practical reason. And for Professor Payares, if you could um, elaborate a little bit on how are we not to confuse freedom of conscience and thought with freedom of opinion. You, you mentioned, so are there some guidelines that would help us not to confuse those? Thank you. Very quickly, we're technically at the end of our panel, but we have a break now. So I think we can probably use this room um, and of course, I encourage you to continue the conversation even after our panel. But if anyone would like to answer. Sure, thank you for that great question. So that's the main question, freedom. Uh, because that, that is the cornerstone of the, the liberal understanding of human dignity. Being human means to have freedom to choose. And uh, I would say, yes, from a natural law perspective, freedom is essential as well to choosing the good. But the main difference from these two perspectives I just defended is, is the element of reason. Uh, because when you leave freedom without reason, it's just the, f the content of your decision is just fill out with your own will. I want this, that's my right, and I want chocolate, and that's my right. I mean, the, the Bolivia, for example, this is not kidding, argued once in the OAS that the playing football, soccer, was a human right. Why? Because Bolivian people really like it in the FIFA, it prohibited to play in La Paz because of the high altitudes, right? So uh, when you, when, when everything is, when freedom is just filled out with your will, there's nothing else. But reason, the, cap the capacity to orient your own freedom with reason, it's the difference, the radical difference between the use naturalist perspective and the other. Not because freedom is not relevant, but because freedom is, has to be oriented through the capacity to uh, discern objective human goods. And those are claims that are rights, not the other's one, not any kind of preference. So that would be my answer. Thanks for your question. Uh, I would say that uh, interpretation of legal language, we can see that it has two limits. It needs to have two limits. One is the semantic limit. The, the, con the words mean something and words have they are not so malleable. They have a definition, a meaning. And, and the other limit would be the teleological limit. And here is where, is where freedom comes into play because, and you were talking about practical re reason too, and freedom and action, uh, 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 freedom is, is acting towards an end, towards the good. So if you understand uh, whichever concept you, you work with, and this is a way to, to tackle, at some point, this evolution and progressive interpretation. The evolution and progressive interpretation cannot be the invention, the creation of new words, new rights, new, new, new text where there's no text. So you always, in interpretation, need to take, make accountable the interpreters, judicial interpreters in this case, of what is the semantic limits of all the decisions, decisions they're making, and what's the theological limit of, of and theological meaning taking into account the, the, what does the law wants to, what's the purpose, but also the action, the concrete actions that are involved in the decision. And here is where freedom of, needs to resurface uh, as true freedom, what it is, acting towards this, this end, towards the good. If you'd like briefly, sure. I can relay the, the, the Charles Malley's explanation on what is the meaning of, of, of freedom of religion and in, as a difference for freedom of opinion. So having an opinion is like an, what, what's my position through to in, in, in relation to the Dosa Cero thing between the U US soccer national team against Mexico. That's an opinion. but. The point of religion it's, and conscience is that when I decide uh, from, the, from the most inner uh, part of my life how to face my life, Malik says that that moment of through of becoming a person, because he, he studied his doctorate with uh, Heidegger, and he relayed this idea and this distinction between Sane and the sane and being and existence and so when we when you choose and we elect you are not only are picking up oh, and I'm gonna put uh, sugar in my coffee or not you are building up your own identity and in, in 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 from the most inner uh, disposition of yourself so 
that's why he said that uh, this is the right of becoming a person. But that's the expression that he used. The, uh, uh, the freedom of conscience is different from different. Op uh, it's different from the right of having an opinion because the opinion is what I think on this a soccer match or whatever. But the freedom of conscience means that I am becoming a person, facing my own existence and and putting myself into this world and. So that, that kind of difference. Thank you. Please join me in thanking our presenters.